against uh, Zhuang Zi and, and his um, recognition of disintegration and of non-identity goes beyond uh, the philosophical developments we find in, in Europe, maybe from, from Nietzsche to, to Adorno and so on, in this attempt to recognize something which goes beyond the rational, which goes beyond uh, a kind of rational control of uh, the subject on the activity of philosophy. So in this sense, and this would be uh, a third point, in this sense, uh, the question of contemporary philosophy and, and how it can relate to the Zhuangzi leads us to the relation between sinology, philology, and, uh, and the Zhuangzi. And of course, I, I very much appreciate the attempt to go beyond somehow classical sinology and to make uh, the attempt to somehow develop a philosophical sinology or maybe better a sinological philosophy that is a philosophy, a philosophy which work, works with uh, Chinese texts but uh, that looks at sinology mainly as a kind of background or as a kind of, of basic training and not as a profession. And I think this is something we, we, we share, uh, that we look on sinology as something uh, which has to be overcome, which has to be uh, overcome by uh, a philosophy which uses uh, sinological methods or sinological training to do philosophy, not to do sinology. But, but at the same time, uh, of course, we, we have to, to face the tradition of sinology in the West and especially in Europe. Uh, that is to say, um, just in the beginning, I don't want to elaborate on this, but just in the beginning, uh, Kai uh, mentioned the so-called uh, Bond School of Sinology and, and the debates um, about the different schools of sinology in Germany and elsewhere, in Germany and elsewhere, and, and I think it would be interesting uh, to to ask ourselves as somehow uh, scholars who have a sinological background to ask ourselves how do we relate ourselves as philosophers to the sinological tradition, for example, of Germany. And, and I think uh, this, is, this is a question which, which is not very, uh, very easy to, to answer because, because often somehow, and this is maybe just um, an assumption which uh, I propose here for discussion, somehow there are sinological prejudices or sinological opinions on which we rely on without knowing it, or on which we rely on in a way that that is not really open to discussion, but but is is more a kind of background, even somehow a kind of ideological background, which uh, may become an obstruction in doing sinological philosophy. And I, I want to, uh, to mention one example which uh, has been important during the last years uh, in uh, the Taiwanese discussion about, about Zhuangzi. And, uh, and this is uh, the 
the work of uh, Jean-François Biotier on the transit. I don't know if, if, you, if you know his books on, on, the, on the transit. Uh, I just want to mention this example because, because uh, it shows in a, in a very interesting way to which extent uh, discussions across uh, the language of, of borders, uh, the borders of language, uh, is still somehow connected to these different backgrounds, not only of philosophy, but, on, on, but also of sinology in, in Europe and uh, in, in the Chinese-speaking world. Uh, the discussion uh, which uh, we had in Taiwan with uh, uh, Jean-François Bietter is interesting in, th in this respect because it has uh, somehow developed to a point where, where very different uh, interpretations of the Zhuangzi can be traced back to, on the one hand, uh, a sinological uh, approach to Chinese philosophy in Europe, and on the other hand, um, an approach to Chinese philosophy and to the Zhuangzi in particular, which is uh, informed by developments in 20th century Chinese philosophy. Uh, so they they, they they appeared in in this encounter somehow of a sinological approach to the Zhuangzi, European sinological approach to the Zhuangzi, and a 20th century Chi Chinese approach to the Zhuangzi, uh, a kind of um, a kind of disagreement, which uh, which led me to to think more in detail about uh, not only the sinological uh, background of uh, Jean-François Billetier, but also of my own sinological background and of the sinological background of other uh, interpretations. And in this sense, uh, we had uh, just, I think, two weeks ago at uh, Academia Sinica, a, a talk by uh, Chen Rongzhuo, who spoke about your book. Wing, and this is Chang Chuck. Yes, yeah, 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 he yeah. spoke. He, he spoke about your Lumanian oh, interpretation yeah. of the Zhuangzi, yeah. <laughs> and and we had uh, a discussion uh, about this. And and when we discussed about this, I also asked myself. Uh, why Luma? Why the choice choice of Luma? Why this kind of approach? And why, for example, on the other hand, Billeter is is coming from the perspective of body phenomenology, and and trying to uh, to open up new perspectives of interpretation uh, through this perspective, or. To go even further, why we have now in Taiwan uh, also perspectives of analytical philosophy uh, trying to uh, to deal with the drums. That is to say, how how do these perspectives relate to the drums? And what what do these perspectives say not only about the drums but also about us, about ourselves, and the way we try to connect to the text. So, in this sense, I would maybe just uh, like to, to ask you to say some words about your psychological and your philosophical or even sociological background in, in dealing with the drums and how you would, you would uh, reflect on the formation of, of this kind of perspective. And this, this leads me to the next point, and this, this is a point which, uh, which has been very important in the, in the discussion 
with uh, Jean-François Bielter, and that is the question of, uh, of subjectivity. Because he uh, has the idea that, that in the Zhuangzi we can find a paradigm of subjectivity, a new paradigm of subjectivity. That is a paradigm of subjectivity which allows to free subjectivity from uh, this kind of enforced relation to rationality, to the control of the self over the self, a kind of rational self-control. And, and of course, this idea of subjectivity, which emerges here in uh, European interpretation of uh, the Zhuangzi, is, is deeply related to what I said at the beginning about the question of translating the Zhuangzi and the question of translating this moment of disintegration of the text. Uh, and it is of course related to what I said about the question of contemporary philosophy and the ways of philosophizing in contemporary philosophy which would be able to, uh, to recognize the possibility of disintegration, of non-identity and of non-rationality within uh, the activity of philosophizing. And that is to say, how can we imagine a subjectivity which is somehow <coughs> in itself related to non-identity and to disintegration? And I think uh, Jean-François Bietier is trying to give an answer. And this answer, of course, leads us to the question of yo, of roaming or rambling, uh, and to the question why exactly this aspect is so prominent in the drums. And uh, in this uh, sense, I want to, to mention uh, a kind of definition which uh, Jean-François Bietier gives of subjectivity. Uh, and I translate, I try to translate his French into, into English. Uh, he says, uh, what we uh, can call subjectivity appears now, that is from the perspective of the Zhuangzi, as a coming and going between emptiness, the emptiness and the things. And he emphasizes that in this in-betweenness, in this coming and going between emptiness and the things, it is the moment of emptiness or the moment of confusion, uh, which is in the Zhuangzi considered as fundamental. So, Seen from this perspective, uh, Jean-François Bietier tries to imagine through the Zhuangzi a notion of subjectivity which would somehow uh, tries to uh, achieve something which I think even Nietzsche did not achieve. Uh, that is, not only to think of the non-subjective, or a kind of recognition of the non-subjective uh, beyond or beside, besides subjectivity, but of the possibility to think of the non-subjective, the non-identical, um, the, the empty, the confused, as something being fundamental for subjectivity. And of course, in Nietzsche, we find, we find uh, many tendencies which go into this direction. But I think what, what somehow is lacking in Nietzsche and also 
in the so-called uh, Nietzscheanism of 20th century European philosophy is the possibility of thinking about this in-betweenness, this roaming between uh, emptiness and the things as something we can cultivate, as something we can exercise. Uh, it is, as I see it, in the Nietzschean tradition, more thought as something which we have to accept, uh, something which we should open up to when we uh, encounter it. And this non-subjective moment, uh, or this Dionysian moment, uh, may appear as madness or something like this. And the question is, how can we deal with this moment? And what I think uh, is interesting is the question whether Zhuangzi went beyond, and in which sense Zhuangzi already went beyond, or can be interpreted as a philosopher who went beyond this kind of modern or even postmodern uh, idea of subjectivity. That is to say, uh, that he, in some way, was able to think of, uh, of this uh, to and fro, of this movement between something we can control and something which is beyond our control, which is emptiness, confusion, chaos, and so on. In which sense, Trance was able to think about this in-betweenness as something which can be cultivated and something which we can deal uh, with in a sense of exercise you spoke also uh, about in your text, of the different uh, levels of Yo in the Zhuangzi and somehow the different levels of being able to, to cultivate this yoing, <laughs> this activity of, of yoing. And I think your paper uh, shows uh, very nicely in, in, the, in the steps you develop in which sense uh, it becomes more and more difficult to to, to speak of cultivation when we uh, face uh, this in-betweenness of yoi. That is to say, uh, in the beginning, there, there is uh, yes, this, how to say, profane or mundane meaning, but then it goes uh, on to, uh, as to a kind of exercise or to a kind of experience which may only be open to certain people, sages, holy men, or so whatever. Uh, so the question would be um, in is in which way uh, you would somehow be interested or, or even accept that it uh, is possible to think about the aspects you mentioned, the, somehow this, this culture of yoing in, uh, within the notion of subjectivity. And this, this leads me to, to another point and this is the relation between uh, yoing and politics. Uh, and you, you, I just, I just want uh, because of uh, of time, and I don't want to speak too long. I just want to mention one passage 
which uh, you cited on page 7 of your paper. Uh, just on the top of the page, let your hot mind roam in the flavorless. Blend your tea with the featureless. Follow the self so of things. Leave no room for what is selfish and the empire will be in order. Mm. Uh, of course, I'm interested in what does this mean mm. and the empire will be in order. Uh, so this, this obviously has, and this, this whole chapter, uh, Ying Di Wang has, has uh, uh, an intrinsic relation to politics, but what kind of politics is this? You didn't speak at all about uh, this, you just mentioned that this is about practice, uh, that Yoshin is a practice and that this leads us to the cultivation of the body and the heart, mind, and so on, but but uh, but you didn't speak about the question of uh, the relation between this kind of of practice and and politics. And I would be interested if you can imagine uh, how this idea of politics could sense uh, could make sense. Uh, for us uh, today, of course, I have I have some idea about how it could make sense, but I will not uh, speak about this now. Maybe I can speak about this in our discussion. And the last point is something which you mentioned, and that is the relation between Zhuangzi and capitalism. And this uh, you mentioned in speaking about. Uh, the relation between roaming and shopping, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and this somehow leads me back to uh, a sinological interpretation of the Zhuangzi we especially find in in French sinology, uh, and that is an interpretation of the Zhuangzi guided by the notion of, of um, efficacy, mm -hmm. efficacité. And you use also the, the word in your in your paper, and and I think and this is uh, what I remember from our discussions on on your interpretation of the Zhuangzi through Lumanian perspectives that that the question of a kind of spontaneous functionality, right. a kind of spontaneous efficacy is of course also very important for, for your approach uh, uh, which tries to interpret the Zhuangzi from the notion of autopoiesis. And, and I think uh, this is something which, which can um, lead us to somehow uh, a deeper discussion of the relation between capitalism and interpretations of the Zhuangzi, a relation which, which would go beyond this phenomenon of shopping and, and touch on the question <coughs> how this, this ideal of a kind of superior efficacy, of a, uh, an extremely uh, developed Efficacy is related to Taoism, and somehow leads us to the question: How? Uh, and this is, of course, a very huge question uh, we may not deal with today. But I just want to to mention it. Uh, this leads us to the question: In which sense uh, Taoism, if we understand Zhuangzi as a Taoist, Taoism? is something uh, important for modern Chinese capitalism. Mostly we speak about Confucianism and work ethics mm. as something being maybe a kind of background for uh, this post Weberian development of Chinese capitalism. But, but this moment 
of uh, is of kind of superior efficacy. This moment of autopoetic activity, which is so important for for especially contemporary capitalism, this moment uh, seems to be not very much related to Confucianism, but rather to a kind of Taoist understanding of efficacy which we encounter so much in French interpretations of Taoism mm. as, as related to subtle strategies, to a kind of strategic thought which, which goes beyond ordinary understandings of, of, of strategy. But, but touches on, on subtle and very uh, so-called natural use of, of strategies. So in this sense, I would, I would ask you, I would like to ask you if, you if you could say something more about your understanding of the relation between drugs and capitalism. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you very much, Fabian, for these very insightful remarks. I'm yeah, very eager to hear Hans Georg's comments, but maybe should we open it? I would, I would appreciate that. Because yeah. we don't have much time, yeah. 20 more minutes, and so maybe we should yeah, collect some few more questions yes. and then yeah. give you a final That sounds yeah. like a very good idea. Very interesting discussion. So maybe there are, yeah, we should accept to collect yeah. some more, a few more questions. Yeah, Chris, maybe yeah. We bring in um, uh, um, another aspect that's usually on the negative side from Nietzsche or Zhuangzi and nationalism or the inside of the confusions. I also grew up uh, in the countryside and I was spent my childhood in the woods, you know, and this was the happiest thing. School is over, you go to the forest, you ramble around, you have friends, and but then uh, during daytime you go to school, in the evening you go home, there is dinner, there is order, without that you can't live. Uh, you will take your flight back home uh, and you don't hope that the pilot will be roaming around. Uh, you want that he is well trained and goes by the rules. Um, so I think there is a need for roaming, um, essential need for roaming for, for animal creatures, for human beings, um, in many, many ways. I mean, you, can, you, you can use cognitive science to make the point very clear. Um, um, but on the other hand, you cannot always play Nietzsche and Zhuangzi and, and, and want to roam around. You need to have your dinner, you want to have your flight. Uh, when I go into the traffic, I don't want people roaming around in the traffic. I want them to follow the rules. Uh, we need a lot of that, actually. Um, so that must be taken into account, too. So where is this line between inside and outside? Uh, how, do, how does one communicate between the inside and the outside? You know, when can I go into the forest? And when I go home, then I must be at home at 6 for dinner. What, what, why that? You know? and if I go into the forest, I cannot take a knife and step out the eye of my friend. It's also not right. Uh, so there's limits to roaming. So, so what between this? We need the inner and the outer. You know, but how do we communicate with the lion and so on? Yeah. So that's something I would like to bring in. Thank you. Another question here on the liberal capitalist order and strong a very interesting, interesting relationship. Maybe? More questions. I'm I think uh, in the end you are, you are, you are suggesting that um, 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 uh, life can either be conceived as a uh, goal end for rational seeking or or, or uh, Roaming or contingency uh, constituted. Um, then, uh, uh, on your quote on Rudestan, and then the communicatively uh, meaningful philosophical discourse, um, I recall the help uh, from uh, Professor Wu uh, Xuxian. Wu Xuxian, do you know? Okay. So he, he, he had taught in, in the state in the, for, for, for a long time. And he said that in the 60s or 70s, um, some of the philosophy departments were closed because at the time there's a uh, professor A uh, wrote, wrote an article and then professor B 
of another university comment on it. And then Professor C of the third university comment on Professor B, and then Professor A comment on Professor uh, C. And then no one else knows what they are looking about. So, uh, so they close the, the department. Um, so will, will this happen if we, if we conceive our lives not as goal-seeking, goal-aiming, but as roaming? And uh, so maybe this is related to Christian's question about in the family of Huang Wei and also, also about our composition. Um, I, I, I would like to have both. I, I, would, I would like to uh, conceive them as, or conceive the, the strong, strong thing I, uh, world as, as consists of, consisting of two parts. So you, you, get, you go roaming, but you will also come back to, well, because um, the danger of your, this potentiality to, 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 to render everything, render everything as roaming will be, will be that we will be, we will, we will be terminated. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would like to um, pose a question on the problem of the uh, roaming together. Uh, in in many texts in in Zhongzi, the roaming uh, often uh, the the word roaming uh, is used to refer uh, to the solitude. Some, we, we have many uh, solitary roaming and, and etc. So uh, if you are um, uh, using the, the, the story of uh, Hui Shi with Zhuangzi uh, and at the end you focus on the roaming together, yeah. so it, it would be a kind of uh, a problem, a challenge to the, the, the Taoist or the, the, the Zhuangzi idea of uh, community, or uh, what's the community of the Zhen, or what's the community of friendship in, in Zhongzi, and uh, how is the, the, the roaming going uh, in, in this kind of uh, solitude descri described by, by Zhongzi uh, in most of the time. And secondly, relate to this question, the, 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 the idea of, uh, of love that or roaming that you mentioned uh, in comparison to uh, Wittgenstein is uh, similar to play or to game. So it, it's a, 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 an, a, an idea of uh, returns. So uh, maybe in, in that sense, you, uh, you will say that uh, in the debate of uh, Hui Shi and Zhuangzi, there is a polemic factor even in the roaming. So it is not a peaceful uh, rom roaming. It's not a, a, a very, very uh, homogeneous uh, rambling. It is uh, a rambling with details, with uh, zigzag, uh, with uh, many differences. So this, uh, maybe in this idea, it could be related to the second uh, chap chapter, yeah, the Qiu Lun. So, uh, but, even in, in that sense, it, there will be uh, a problem of uh, treating the differences uh, in, in this idea of play. And at the end, uh, the so-called uh, rainbowing uh, rainbow subject could be uh, just a, a, a player of the rainbowing itself. So it is not a guy, a subject who uh, rainbows uh, somewhere or nowhere, it could be that uh, uh, there is no such subject. It is just the the rainbowing itself, which circulates over or in or on that uh, subject. So it could be uh, the, the case in uh, I could uh, deduce from the, what you said. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, maybe the final question. I don't think uh, the description of Yao Yu Wu Ren Zi Ye uh, that you mentioned in your uh, in the section three uh, of your paper. Uh, you say uh, 
a Zhuangzi has an existence uh, outside the human sphere. And so uh, you describe it uh, as a better, uh, 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 extraordinary state of trance. So I don't think so, because uh, uh, the Tian and Ren, uh, the heaven and the humanity is not uh, 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 is not split into two parts. So uh, we should say Zhuangzi has a new style construction of human world. New style construction of construction of human world. So in this new style construction of human world, uh, a competent sage can swim uh, swiftly, uh, softly, and freely uh, inside it uh, without what? any hinder. Between what? Huh? He can swim between what? Swim between in the what? New, new style human world. New, New style of human world, uh, uh, without any uh, hindrance, uh, uh, f softly, freely, uh, uh, easily. So, like the like the how ding jian you know, like the 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 luxury, the shuk uh, with a, a knife, uh, 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 a swimming uh, in the body of the the the, the cow, the buffalo. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe I, I, I think one make one final point. And then yeah. So we'll just give you the final time and the remaining time. Yeah. I, I find your idea, the final idea, very interesting that you you, you try to you know, redescribe or to to to, to remind us that uh, the idea of philosophical discourse in itself is maybe highly problematic or means. Uh, we need to rethink our understanding of philosophical discourse. So you mentioned Wittgenstein and bring up this idea of observing very closely human life. And if somehow you think that there is a relationship maybe between Taoist Yo rambling and, and Wittgenstein's philosophical style and philosophical investigation. So I somehow wonder or, or maybe even worry that, 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 that if we really accept this this is, is your thought on page 11, that your life is just contingency. And it's just about communication. And where do the questions come from? The philosophical questions. Because John Lee himself, he doesn't really believe in philosophical questions. I, maybe, maybe I, I, yeah, I ask you more to provoke an answer there. Maybe, again, we do believe that John Lee believes in the need of, for questions. So we have 10 more minutes. Or even more, 50 more minutes. Yeah, so, yeah. Go ahead. I'm a little overwhelmed. There has been so much said by Fabian to begin with, and then uh, by the other people who spoke. So, I am, uh, I'm sure I cannot really uh, come up with any sort of adequate response to the complexity of all the things that were brought up. Still rambling. I will. I will. <laughs> I will. So I'll just speak briefly, and then maybe some. Say something more. Uh, just I uh, will address few of the th a few of the themes that were brought forth by the various people. Number one is this connection between roaming and efficacy uh, that came up with Fabian, but also with others. Um, so I tried to point out again um, in that that roaming is just on the one end. Of course, it's a playful form of. of motion or whatever being in the world at the same time and you know remember I mentioned the example of children but even uh, animals even more so probably is very much at the same time efficacious right it is something it is a mode where you are very much at the same time also fulfilling most basic needs for survival right so uh, right I said attentiveness for food and so forth so this very mode is not is not a mode that is just you know taking a break uh, from the serious activities of life that somehow surround it, but it's actually uh, at the same time a most uh, in many ways like an extreme uh, a mode of increased efficacy. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would not agree with what uh, I wouldn't like my paper to be read in the way that, that Christian apparently uh, read it. 
that, uh, that it is just a form of, of leisure activity inserted in between, let's say, you know, the serious and really efficacious form of life. I would say it's exactly, in, in, in a sense, the opposite. Um, so it's not just taking a break, right? Uh, that's, that's not what's wrong. Uh, the the other thing I wanted to address is, I mean, the, the, the whole thing was was meant to be at least in one aspect of it, uh, an analysis of this very famous uh, uh, passage from the Zhuangzi where we have fish and uh, and uh, Zhuangzi talking about the happiness of fish, which is also basically about a philosophical question, and the answer is the, the answer or the, the dialogue. Of, revolves around this question an or whence, where from uh, and um, let us think perhaps uh, when we or, uh, two aspects to it on the one hand I think all, probably also in Chinese context isn't it the case, I mean it's very common like for Germans or Westerners when you engage in a conversation with friends uh, sometimes there is a moment in the conversation where, where people ask and says, how do we get here, right? How, do, wh how did we arrive at this topic? And then people sort of reconstruct, yeah, we were talking about this and then and then and then and this is how we arrived at this sort of strange, uh, 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 strange uh, things, thing we just said now. Is that also common like among Chinese people when they have communication? That sometimes you interrupt the communication with friends and say, hey, how do we get to... To, to, to talk about this, it's a question. Do you, is that common? You know what I'm talking about, I suppose. Professor Fong, that you Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And I think we can look at philosophical, or this, we, could, we can learn from this situation also for how we do philosophy. And somehow I think that's also what's going on here in the story between Tranda and Pulsha. They ask and says, hey, how did, we, how did we get here, right? And then, well, we see two things about this. First, how do we get? How do we get here? It wasn't just like one person. It always needs like a broader context. It's not just one person like Descartes in his meditation, you know, trying to isolate himself and then think correctly because there is no sort of it, external interference that is disturbing his, you know, uh, his geometrical line of thought, right? And, and we do philosophy just as we do everyday conversation in the context that is beyond control, right? There are all kinds of impulses coming in which lead us to specific, uh, to, to, to develop certain things. And uh, so we have to, in this sense, the philosophers also have to reflect on the complexity that brought them there, which often goes much beyond the specific issue, right? This is basically also what philosophy and roaming needs to open up your perspective and, and look at, so to speak, the complexity of, of the environment which led you to this sort of specific place that you just arrived at. And, and the, the, the interference was, much, was perhaps much more complex or in other ways also much more profane uh, than, than there and certainly much less, so to speak, um, uh, directed or, or, or led by some sort of necessity. In that, how, how can I say that? Um, when you ask yourself that question in, in, in a, in a commun communication, you reflect on the contingency that actually brought you there. There was no primary intention, there was no teleology involved. And so you reflect yourself and, and reconstruct the path that led you there, and you're sort of astonished that you got to a certain place that you never really intended to get, get to. And I think that's also uh, a, a part of that story that goes on with, with Hoysha and, and Juanza in that story, that we sort of uh, have this aha erlebnis, we have this sort of uh, uh, realization of, of, the, of the wider complexity that while focusing on a specific argument uh, had had uh, had sort of blinded us uh, uh, and, and then we open up a, a sort of a broader perspective. So in that sense, again, uh, also, uh, while on the one hand, uh, Christian said, perhaps we think that we have certain little breaks of yowing between a larger framework of necessity, actually these 
experiences of communication shows us that we have little episodes of necessity in a wider context <laughs> of, of, of contingency. Right? That we have an airplane and that we go from point A to B is part of a much wider network of, of contingencies around it. And so it is actually, the, in this way, it would be a point, to, a way, a way of, of, of summarizing the intention of my paper. It is actually not so much the case that necessity necessitates contingency, but that contingency makes necessity contingent. That would be one way of, of summarizing uh, what I tried to say. And I think this, 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 this experience when we reflect on how do we get to this, to talk this, uh, you know, thing which seemed so... Uh, yeah, but anyways, I think you got what I meant to say. Sorry. If you want to base things on contingencies, you get the problems. Um, like how much should your airplane ticket cost? $1,000 or $10,000? You know, should men and women be separated? Should women allow to fly airplanes and stupid things like that? Because human beings make these rules. Which which rules we take? How much tax should we pay? Fifty percent, two hundred percent, two thousand percent? Or and we have to make choices, and we cannot just say, oh, it's just coincidence, it's chance, let's ramble. You know? So my, the point I was trying to make is that um, I personally think that I want to ramble a lot, yeah. But on the other hand, I know that. Uh, there are certain things that have to be written down on paper, rules, regulations. How much, you know, death penalty, death penalty or not? How much imprisonment for stealing? One year, five years, head off, or just say, well, you are human, you can do it three times. So I think these are the problems we are facing. Uh, you know, or capitalism, or, or money distribution, you know, poor and rich. You know. So these are the problems we have to face. Uh, and then, how do we how do we try to make good solutions? And th that was the where I wanted to go. Mm. So how do we combine trying to be rational and taking care of contingencies that are there? Yeah, our, our knowledge is very limited, right? So that was what I was trying what I was trying to push. On. Maybe maybe I just make a remark on this. I think we can only find good solutions when we are able to recognize contingency. And maybe even, I'm not sure if, if I would follow uh, Hans Georg uh, in saying that contingency is the basis for necessity somehow. Uh, but, but somehow if we, and this is, and this is, I think is a kind of basic, basic conviction in the Tronzo, which we always, and again, find in the Tronzo that that the recognition of contingency is, is essential for ordering the world. And this was my question about the political. Yeah. What, how is, there is, the, he, he imagines political order. <coughs> but this political order is not, is not based on, on the norms you have in mind. <laughs> but on what? If there is a basis at all, can you continue more? Or oh, Fabio? Or oh, maybe you can have some more comments, final comments. So I just maybe you can say something about subjectivity. Uh, yeah, yes, this was a very important <laughs> question. Yeah, because I know that came up at the end, but I. Uh, I mean, also and had a also different no? idea. Or as a really Nietzsche, we could overcome the limits of post Nietzschean European for the philosophy. I found this is very interesting. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Said I'm a little overwhelmed. With, uh, this. I'm, I'm not familiar. For instance, you referred to this Beatia and you know those earlier writings, but I forgot about these two, so I don't really know about them. Uh, I don't know about them, so I'm not familiar with that discourse. Again, I have no point really to approach the okay. question. So that's uh, my con our contingencies are different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are on different paths. So I don't really know because. No, I mean, because you were saying, you know, this has to do with like these Philip Pair books that I, I didn't really read, so... Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. 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 So we yeah. I think we did one and a half hour, so we did our... Okay. Is that a yeah. 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 Yeah.